Hi there. This is HTTP Can Do That, a collection of bad ideas by me, Sumana Hariharishwara. And there is a seat in the front row. So as I mentioned, uh, this is a talk mostly meant for people who have done at least a little bit of web dev. Um, and so I'm going to have some introductory material here. But soon after that, there may be some bits that if you've never done, if you've never written a web application before, you may feel a little bit overwhelmed. And if so, you may wish, and it's completely OK to go to one of the other talks, such as the more beginner level, How the Internet Works Overview, which is in 201. HTTP is part of the backbone of our internet. It is a really fundamental protocol. It stands for the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And today I'm going to be talking with you about some things you can do using that protocol, some of which you should do, some subset of which you should not do, but which are funny. Um, if you want to learn more, you can read the RFC, the request for comment. That's the specification, uh, according to the Internet Engineering Task Force, or IETF, that tells you how this thing works, how the server should talk HTTP, how the browser should talk HTTP, and so on. There are diagrams. There's an ASCII art in the RFC. So how intimidating could it be? <laughs> I have decided that I would break out my LibreOffice skills and create uh, a little bit more in the way of diagrams. There's a, a client, which you could, I guess it sort of looks like a person, but it's meant to be a computer. Um, and so that might be the browser on your laptop, your desktop, your mobile device. It might be an application, like a mobile app. I hear people are into that. Um, and then over on the other side is a server that for instance, hosts a website, such as www.sumina.biz. I don't think there's a sumina.biz. If that's registered by the end of this 45 minutes, I'll be a little embarrassed. <laughs> so let us say that you, uh, at the client, you, you tell your browser, I'm kind of interested in what's at www.sumina.biz. So you type that into your browser, and your client sends a request, which is a kind of HTTP message, to the server. The server processes this request and sends back an HTTP response, another kind of message, back to the client. Let me just outline for you the basic structure of an HTTP message. This is plain text. You can look at it, and we'll be looking at some of it later in this 45-minute session. There are three parts. Start line. The start line says the HTTP version that we're talking. This is a, a protocol, right? So we versioned it over time. There's a new one coming out that's incompletely implemented in a lot of places, and that's HTTP2. I will not be talking about HTTP2 in this presentation. This is a good moment to leave if that was all you wanted. Um, <laughs> I will be talking 1.1, which is in all the standard libraries, all the servers, whatnot, unless, I don't know, you're running like the, one of those boxes from Jurassic Park. Like, this is Unix. I know this. Like, that might be 0 0.9 or something, right? Um, and then if it's a request, the request method, such as get or post, I'll go into those. If it's a response, the response status code, those integers, I'll go into those. Second part of a message, the headers, like, what type of content is, going to, is this uh, referring to? What is the length of the content? Third part, an optional body. that Sometimes people call this the payload. Here, it's a pretty picture of a chandelier. Maybe more re message bodies should be pretty pictures of chandeliers. I don't know. So here's an example request. The start line might be get, this method, slash the path, in this case it's the root, the top level thing, HTTP 1.1, the language we're speaking. Headers might include, this is just some of the headers, the host, hey, what server do I care about? What I would like to accept, what kind of content, in this case, HTML. And let's say the user agent here is some kind of program you've written to scrape the web, and you've called it ScraperBot, so that might be what you put in the user agent field. And uh, by the way, sorry, uh, the body was empty because this particular kind of request does not need a request body. The example response starts with that start line that tells you 200, uh, the version of HTTP, 200 OK. That is to say, yep, all's fine. Here's that document. 
some headers, such as you know, the date and the time it was last modified, and then the body, which is, there you go, it's some text in the form of HTML, tells you, welcome to Sumataville, it's a pretty rocking site. <laughs> so here are the real popular methods. I mean, these are the Dave Matthews band of methods. Um, <laughs> And that they're popular, that's all. <laughs> that's all. Um, so get and post. Gimme and here you go. These, for many of us, are the verbs that we know about in how to talk to HTTP. And one reason is, this is what HTML lets you do. So if you started learning how to make web apps by learning how to make HTML forms, this was what you had access to. Here's the first bad idea of the day. You could have a site where people could post documents but never get them. <laughs> you just did not allow. So let's say you're using Python. Here, uh, this is some Python 2 code. There's more here. I'm just excerpting the relevant bits to help you understand this. So you subclass the base HTTP request handler that's built into the standard library. And you create a new class. And the way that works in Python 2 is if you subclass the base HTTP request handler, you got to define a method for any HTTP verb you want to be able to deal with. And so ordinarily, you would absolutely define a, a function called do underscore get. But you don't have to. <laughs> and so for instance, I haven't included the code here, but in this particular API, there was a moment in when we were writing it when we had defined post but not get. So people could post content in. Maybe they'd get a response in the response body. Then again, not. And also, if you did a get, you just get a, I don't know anything about that method. Some use cases. Letters to Santa Claus. <laughs> Ploy suggestion box. <laughs> Extremely moderated blog comments. <laughs> I, 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 can imagine, I can imagine doing that. OK, and here I think it's time for a small logistical note. As I mentioned earlier in the beginning of this talk, this is a collection of bad ideas. Many of these are very bad ideas. This is what a good idea feels like to me. This is a, a snapshot I took at the Recurse Center in New York City. There's a whiteboard, there's natural light, there's a plant, you know, there's people having interesting conversations. And oh, yes, this, this idea, it might, it might lead to uh, something more elegant and more performant. This is very nice. And a bad idea is horror world. <laughs> this is a snapshot I took in Mysore, in Karnataka, India. Um, and it says horror world in uh, transliterated in. Uh, so it says horror world. Uh, it doesn't actually translate into Kannada in case you were wondering, oh, so now I know how to say horror world in Kannada. No, you know how to write horror world in Kannada. That's all. <laughs> so the bad idea scale. <laughs> when, uh, some things I'll just be going past real fast, but in, when I go into a little bit of detail about an idea, I'll try to tell you whether I think it's more horror world or more plants and whiteboards. And I think that giving a client no way to get is a bad idea. Because if nothing else, you'll want you know, Santa or uh, the blog moderator to be able to read those things. right? And probably you want them to do that through a web app or through an admin panel or something. So you'll have to implement get at some point, even if there's a pretty tight auth around who can get those resources. Maybe. So um, this is, by the way, this is a one-way presentation. Um, <laughs> FYI, <laughs> I can post to you and you, anyway. Um, so perhaps some of you remember the phrase CRUD. About four main things you might want to do with data in some kind of application or system. You might want to create, read, update, and delete it. So if you're using get and post, then here's how you do that. And you may have noticed that three of these are the same, and I find that inelegant. <laughs> And I, for one thing, think that it's kind of nonsensical to post in order to delete something. To, and you know what? You post like an empty uh, request body, and you say, we'll replace it with it. Anyway, there is an HTTP method called delete. It's in the spec. It's in the RFC. You can delete a document, an image, a resource, as we might say. So let's say you wanted to implement this. So uh, here is some code I wrote. 
uh, server, again, I was just subclassing from the base server in the Python standard library. So in one terminal over here, I'm serving it at port 8000, the official port of localhost. No, um, <laughs> the official, oh, please don't ever deploy this anywhere public port, I guess. Okay, in another terminal, in, I'm using Python, and I say, okay, I'd like to import the requests library, which is a fantastic Python library for dealing with the web, dealing with HTTP, dealing with APIs, and you can send requests and look easily at the responses that you get. The data structures are real nice. So I say, okay, I'd like to get, just to, let's, let's just test this out. Let's take this for a ride first. Yeah, okay, can I get the root at localhost, eight, port 8000? The answer is yes. I could, and here's the log in that other terminal window saying, yes, yeah, someone got root uh, and got a 200 OK response. That's, everything's fine. Here's the code where I implemented delete, that do underscore delete. So there's a moment where, OK, yes, you told me a file name. Use the OS module, and you just remove it. It's like RMing a file. There's no off here. <laughs> I did uh, make it so that you can only delete the path file to delete dot text, <laughs> just in case. But also, this is only, please never run this in production. Like, <laughs> please don't take this. Anyway, I, I, is there a way that I can, is there an OSI approved license for, look at this code, but if you run this in production, like, God help you. <laughs> anyway, just as a bit of proof, okay, here's a terminal where I say, okay, hey, ls file to delete. Yep, that's there. All right, requests, I use the request library to send a delete request. And in the logs, you see that went through fine. LS again, what? What file? Never heard of that file. You must be thinking of some other file than file to delete dot text. And when you look at the response from sending that delete request, it's code 204, which means no content, which is in the standard, the way that you say, yeah, I went ahead and deleted that for you, and now there's no content there. It's as if it was never there. Is delete a good idea? Under some circumstances, in some context, sure. If you got a bit of a walled garden, and you know that behind these extremely high doors, only some clients have access to that method or that resource to, to delete it, um, then yeah, you might want to be programmatically creating, updating, and deleting resources all the time. If not, you're, you're at risk of horror world. Some underappreciated methods. So here's put, otherwise known as here you go. It's in the spec. Hold on, wait. I thought post meant <laughs> here you go. Well, what is post anyway? Well, according to the standard, it means basically this is above our pay grade, take it to the boss. HTTP doesn't have a set way of knowing what post means. Does it mean create a new resource? Does it mean this has something to do with this resource under some circumstances? And one way to think of this is overloaded post. We often, as web developers, use it for creating a new item in this set. Like, OK, there's a thing called a blog. Blog posts are entries. They're a kind of thing that exists within a blog. When I post to this particular URL, what I mean is create a new item in the set of blog posts. Here's an example. So here is a uh, photo of some punch cards from a Jacquard loom in a museum in England. Because it's good to have a nod to our heritage as programmers. So let's say uh, that I did a put request versus doing a post request. A put request to slash card slash five, you know, on some website with that as a body means put this picture at cards five. That's what resource goes at that URL. It's unambiguous. Post means tell the web app that this picture applies to this path somehow. Go, go figure it out. And so it's more ambiguous. And if you have a choice and you know that what you want to do is create a resource with that particular payload, go ahead and use put. Same for update. And then for delete, you can use delete. And then this is a little bit more elegant. But if you are always going to want for a web application written in, let's say, a scripting language to make decisions about what to do with what you're do putting in there, then you know, go ahead and use post. But if you, you could just write something where all it knew about was HTTP and the semantics of these verbs, these methods, and that would work out OK. I think put is a really good idea, and it's in production in lots of APIs right now. Some more underused methods. Patch. Patch. Oh, yeah, hey, Nick. Uh, there's someone named Nick Patch here. 
And he asked if I was going to. They asked if I was going to cover the um, uh, the method having to do with their name. Uh, I'm sorry that there's no Nick method yet. We can make one. Um, update just part of this document or resource. Uh, this is not as 100% implemented in all you know the libraries that you might be using to talk to HTTP. But if you have it, it's a pretty good idea. The only reason I'm not putting it all the way in the whiteboard and plant area is because you know, in whatever your language of choice is, it might not be as well thought about, uh, well, well implemented. Options. Just think about Picard, like, I want options. Like, uh, it's a way of saying, hey, what methods do you support either for this specific resource or server wide? Also, pretty good idea. Here's a super cool method. It's head. And it's like get, but it's just for metadata. Which, what that means is, OK, let's compare these two requests. If you say that you want to get the root of some website, then you're going to get the start line and the headers and the body. If you say head, you get all the same things except the body, which means it saves you and the server time on processing that and, and bandwidth and whatnot. And so it saves time. So let's say you pull up, uh, I'm just going to prove this a little bit. Um, I sound, I sound like I'm going to bro down. I'm going to prove this to you. Like, it, not, none of you questioned me. I didn't hear like a pantomime hiss or like a, no, that can't possibly be Sumana. <laughs> um, anyway, but I'll, I'll prove it anyway. Um, so let's say you use IPython and uh, you say of some URI, uh, some web address, which is in this case a picture in Wikimedia Commons, and you try getting it and you try heading it, there is this percent time it thing you can do in IPython to say, hey, how fast is this? And it'll try doing it a few times and tell you how fast the best one was, which I think is pretty cool as a way of checking on profiling without being as anecdotal. I mean, this is obviously anecdotal, but it's less anecdotal, right? It's just artisanal data, as the saying goes. <laughs> and you can see how much faster, 163 milliseconds instead of 1.33 uh, seconds for heading instead of getting. And a lot of the time, you only need that metadata. You don't need the body to check, does this exist? Do I have permission to get it? What's the content length? When was it last modified? What kind of thing is it? What's the E tag, which is sort of like a version control you know, revision marker? If this site has been completely slash dotted, what is the date after which I should retry getting this content? And so if you're doing certain kinds of applications or templates or what have you within your applications, let's say a sort of table of contents or something like that, Often, this will be good enough for some of what you need. So I think head is firmly in plants, natural light, whiteboards territory. Let's talk about some of those headers that you can get, whether you are, and some of the ones that you'll send in your request, or some of the ones that you'll get back uh, in your response. Content type, content length. You've probably seen content type before. Some people think of this as mime. Uh, and so some of the more popular classifications include text slash various things, text slash plain, text slash HTML. There's also application slash, and sometimes you see, you know, slash JSON or something like that. There's a chemical one. <laughs> Who here already knew that? OK, yeah, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. You, I wish I had like some free thing to throw you. It would be made of chemicals, because everything is. So um, <laughs> yeah, I, I believe there was a time right, when we had a wide variety of chemical markup languages that really had sort of a first class status in MIME to describe molecules and whatnot with. And you know, my, my hat's off to you, chemists and data scientists, chemists and whatnot. Some other popular headers, some of these are sort of in pairs, like request response pairs. Like I might say in my request, these are the encodings that I'm willing to accept. And then the content encoding in the response would, you know, the application has a chance to only give me something that I can deal with. Same with language. This e tag business is pretty interesting. E tags are a way of saying of a particular document that, okay, this is sort of version number string, you know, a, a, a long, long, long number. And that way I can say, hey, if that document is this e tag, or if this document is not this e tag, then perform this action on it. You know, getting, putting, posting, what have you. There's those modified dates, right? Again, you can do similar things. Like you can say, you give a conditional get. You can say, please get me this document 
only if it has been modified since such and such a date, because otherwise I got it in my local cache. And then the cache control header is a way of being granular. You can sort of live lightly upon the earth if you want and sort of be a particular kind of digital fruititarian by saying, only get me this if it's in a cache. Because that way you're never causing the server to have to do more work you know, by hitting the database or what have you. And then every once in a while, you, know, you won't be able to get this document. But other than that, you'll be like, oh, OK. I'm not causing any extra work for the living servers of the world. Um, so <laughs> if anyone tries this, tell me how it works out. <laughs> Here's a real popular header, user agent, a way of saying to the server, what browser you're using, or if this is an app, or if this is a particular API client, or something like that. Here's an unpopular header from the email address of the person making the request. <laughs> this is in the spec. If you want to, you can look. Look at the RFC. You will see that there is an incredibly rarely used header for requests called from. Back in the day when you were running a server and you get what? 10 requests a day. I guess if your server that was running like Perl 0.5 crashed, then you might be like, oh, oh, Allison was trying to get that. I should email her and tell her the site's back up. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. <laughs> But as you know, you and I, uh, we probably don't have that particular need as much anymore. So, but what could you use from for? Really bad off? <laughs> Just the spec specifically says not to do this. <laughs> you know, we only let people get this resource or change it or delete it if they have the right email address as specified in the from header that they get to write. <laughs> Yes, I saw your site launch. Because, and you can prove it, because you sent a GET request with your email in the phone. <laughs> yes, I saw your Uber for cats, yes. OK. Coded messages meant for the network surveiller. <laughs> because I would bet you that if you look in server logs, you generally won't find that if your get server is getting a lot of requests, uh, that your server logs all of every HTTP request. What you actually save and hold on to is stuff you might need for debugging later. So you probably don't even know if someone has sent you a request that had a from in it. But maybe a surveiller would notice. <laughs> Ed at word dot Snowden. <laughs> is my email. From is horror world, I think, and you should not use it for anything in production, perhaps pranks, self-edification, that sort of thing. Here's another spy trick, though. Did you know that headers are case insensitive, according to the spec? And so you could vary the case of the headers you send as a way to send secret messages? <laughs> this is a bad idea. <laughs> Whoever, no matter your threat model, I think they'll catch on. <laughs> the, the threat model flowchart here is all the different threats, and then they just all go to, I think they'll catch on. <laughs> OK, here's a popular header. This is host. And in fact, it's a required header. If you are sending a request, you need to say what the host is. And host and the path work together. So Netcat is a utility that is probably on your computer right now. It allows you to send, to write HTTP messages and send them over the wire. Remember, these messages are just text. You can look at them, you can inspect them, you can fiddle with them. So this is not programming the sense of telling a computer, uh, is not telling my computer, oh, do these arcane things. I am writing an HTTP message to be sent in plain text over the wire to a server. And so here it's, I tell Netcat, hey, my hostname.tld on port 80, send this to that. So my OS does the lookup of what IP address to send that to using the domain name service. And then here's that start line, get, let's say the path is slash bicycle, HTTP 1.1, and then a header, host, my hostname.tld, that's what goes in the header. So host and path work together. Here's a screenshot of a web page that I have Firefox developer tools or Chrome developer tools open. So I've zoomed in here on the URL 
astoriabookshop.com slash event slash storytime-73. And then I've opened up in the developer tools so you can look at the general information of what the remote address is. My operating system has figured out what the IP address is that it should be communicating with, and it does that. It's made the URL. And then the request headers, the first one is get slash event slash storytime73. What is it coming off of the root that I want? And then the host is that domain, that server. Similarly, do butterflies hold the answer to life's mysteries? I am denying you whether it is, because I got those developer tools open. <laughs> so you can't actually see the story, my apologies. <laughs> um, BBC.com is the host. And again, you're getting what's off of the root. Wait, why do we need to repeat this? It's in the URL. Why do you need to say in a header what the host is when, for instance, netcat, I, I'm telling that to netcat twice, right? Because I told netcat my hostname.tld80. And then host, I also said it in the header. That's a repetition. That feels inelegant, doesn't it? Is there a stamp in my future? Well, not so much. Because, you see, HTTP is separate from the domain name system. These HTTP messages that you are writing and reading are plain text that goes over the wire, and the domain name system is how we know what IP address corresponds in terms of the sending and the receiving. But also, the real reason host was introduced is because host helps route those requests among different domains that sit on the same server, often also known as virtual hosts. So for instance, there's www.debian.org, and then there's bugs.debian.org, lists.debian.org, wiki.debian.org. These are different subdomains, different virtual hosts. And so a request saying, I want this host or that host, I want bugs.debian.org, I want, and so on, and then the path would fall on that. Um, so, but watch out, netcat, debian.org, port 80, host a thing that is not a host at debian.org. And then I get a response that basically says, hey, I just installed a server. <laughs> 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 I did not do any particular vulnerability checking on this. So I haven't, you know, poked around and looked at whether, for instance, I now could tell that there were servers that I was not supposed to have access to or anything like that. Let me tell you a spam story that also has to do with this incongruity of host in the host header and what domain you're actually sending a request to. I installed a site, Drupal. I looked at my 404 logs the next day in sort of the panel, and this is what it told me, is that I'd gotten a 404 for some other person's website? <laughs> huh? And then I looked at the access logs raw, and I saw this get, and I've of course changed the site. It wasn't myfishingsite.biz. <laughs> I think they're not as obvious as that these days. And you see that that's not a legit mistake because a legit mistake would have that slash at the beginning because anything that someone wants to get comes off of the root. So here's how you do that. You intentionally malform your request. Yes, say, hey, netcat, please send something to my hostname.tld. But then what you get, you know, you say in the path or in the host, you say spam.com. Or if you want it to look a little tiny bit more legit, maybe you have <laughs> some nonsensical path like slash Viagra-Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> and what then happens is if someone's looking in their Drupal admin console, their WordPress admin console, they might see that and they might click. And then they get phished, then they get malware. Or if, for whatever reason, the external internet has access to these giant lists of the 404 logs or access logs, well, then Google PageRank happens, right? The spider will see that your site is linking to spam.com. Don't do this. It's horror world. If you learn about an interesting edge case or loophole because spammers taught it to you, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> You can define your own header. The RFC says header fields are fully extensible. There is no limit. There's no limit on what you can win. There's no limit on the introduction of new field names, and so on. If you're going to do this, the general convention to do is to prepend it with x dash. So for instance, a Debian server has 
X clacks overhead, and the value is GNU Terry Pratchett. Because in the Discworld novels by Terry Pratchett, there is a clack system that is a little bit like our internet. And if a clax operator dies, then making sure their name continues to be spoken in those clax terminals from one to the other means that as long as their name is spoken, they will never truly die. You can define your own header. So here I have used netcat, which uh, you, uh, is often abbreviated as NC. And I've told it, hey, here's a response to send to any request coming in on port 8000 until uh, everything here up until I type the exclamation point. So the start line says 200 OK. The content type is text HTML. But the bit I've circled in red is that the header is called glub. And the value is summonerific. And I went to localhost 8000 in a browser. Firefox Developer Tools was able to parse that just fine. Glub, summonerific. I should have prepended this with an X. It should have been x dash glub. I'm a bad netizen. <laughs> and in case you are curious what netcat looks like when, once it receives that request, you see that this is the text of that request, and you see all these headers. This is often a good idea if you know that the people, the clients, the servers that you're talking to care about some of the same things as you. It can be a quick way to get some things across, as opposed to having to write a whole new application. Just don't go all sort of uh, the balkanized, perhaps, as a term. Let's talk about status codes, response status codes. There's five classes of them. 100 and 101 are informational, like, yeah, OK, go on. The 200 series basically say, this request was successful in one of these ways. For instance, 200 OK is one you're, you've probably seen. The three XX series, uh, the 300s, are redirection, like, oh, different URL for what you want. 400 is you screwed up, client error. 500 is server error, I screwed up. Technically, it isn't just 200 OK or 404 not found. No, there's two parts of it, right? There's the code, which is this three-digit int, and there is a reason phrase, such as not found. There are standard reason phrases in the specification. A client should ignore the reason phrase content. You should only be caring about that integer. You don't have to. <laughs> Just FYI. <laughs> so here are some of the somewhat more obscure ones. 410, gone. It was here, but now it's not. 410, 404 is just what resource? What document? I never heard of that. What? What? 410 is, yeah, I know you're looking for that coupon that we issued in April of 2012. It is gone and is not coming back. 304 not modified. Remember those conditional gets I mentioned that say, hey, only go to the bother of getting me this thing if it had been modified since such and such a date. If it hasn't been, 304 is a programmatic and elegant way of saying to that client, it hasn't been modified since that date. So whatever you got in your local cache, go ahead and use that. 451 unavailable for legal reasons. The server is legally required to reject the client's request. In other words, can't let you see that it's censored. So for instance, in India, the map, I just, I'm, like, I'm looking at Eric now. I'm like, <laughs> uh, there are some maps of India you are not allowed to distribute within India because the Indian government is wrong about some border things. Can't let you see that it's censored. I'm going to quote here from RESTful Web APIs by Leonard Richardson and Mike Amundsen. This is considered a client side error, even though the request is well formed and the legal requirement exists on the server side. After all, that representation was censored for a reason. There must be something wrong with you, citizen. <laughs> <laughs> this is not absolutely quite a standard yet. It's Tim Bray's internet draft that's up in the fifth or sixth draft. Uh, and I think it's, it's partially implemented in a lot of places. And it is a good idea to use. I like that we can communicate economically to people and say, and, and to other parts of your own web app to say, this isn't just a 404 not found. This isn't just a 403 forbidden. This is 451. It's the government that won't let you do this, that won't let you see this. Now some WTF responses. All of these were found in the wild. There was a researcher who sent some requests to servers that are up and running and serving web pages. 
And here's some of the findings. 126 is not a real response code. It's not in the spec. And don't give that reason to any attacker who happens by. That's a bad idea. I think someone forgot to fill in a variable here. <laughs> <laughs> 403 forbidden. Okay, all right. It's uh, yeah, a little witty. <laughs> if you can explain this to me, I may buy you a beer. <laughs> That's not a reason. <laughs> That's the same thing again. Again, no, don't tell attackers this. No. No, we have something else for that. <laughs> if you're telling people 200 forbidden, you're like that, that person who like, starts saying goodbye instead of hello when shaking, because like, it's a social breach experiment, man. Like, <laughs> do you realize that it's a social construct? Yes, that is what we depend on, OK? <laughs> Now, while Apple web objects may be an error, <laughs> it's not a reason for 404. We have something else for that. <laughs> That's not even a real code. <laughs> we actually do know the reason phrase for this. My butt is fine, thank you. <laughs> this is not a real code. Really also not a real code. My understanding is this is a Cloudflare error that we, the end users, are never supposed to see. Oops. I believe Audrey said, is this an SAT question? <laughs> this is so not a real code. <laughs> Just because 999 is the emergency number where you live doesn't mean you should use it as a Here's an error, and I'm not going to tell you anything else that would help you debug things. If you wanted to change the reason phrases that your server emits, you could. So this is Python 3 code, just to change it up. You know, we've gotten later in the talk, so now we've gone from Python 2 to Python 3. Um, <laughs> just as all of you should be writing Python 3. And so you import HTTP.server, and then you subclass, again, this base server, this simple one. And then you just take those responses, which are a dictionary, and you just change. There's a short reason phrase and what's supposed to be a long reason phrase. So here I change from 200 instead of OK. Now it's all correct, which is apocryphally the origin of OK. There's more at this GitLab repo. And indeed, I tried getting something, and I got 200 all correct in my browser. This is a terrible idea. <laughs> Don't break language. <laughs> There's so much more. This has been only 40 minutes. I have not had a chance to talk to you about so much that exists in HTTP 1.1 that you can play with, maybe even use. There are ways to deliberately tell clients, please don't cache this. Maybe you have a real fast moving news event. There's a header called pragma that lets you directly pass instructions in the value of the header. There's methods I never talked about, like connect, trace, link, unlink. Trace can sometimes be useful if you're trying to figure out a problem in your request getting to where it's supposed to get. 409 conflict, a way of saying, hey, there was a change in state in between when you thought you were going to send that request and when it got here. Look before you leap requests, a way of saying, hey, server, if I posted a 50 gig photo to this, would it work? And then the server can either say, yeah, go ahead, or no. <laughs> <laughs> The resources, you may think that HTTPS is just, you know, HTTP plus SSL. No, there's a lot more to it than that. It's more complicated. And for instance, the spec says there's no reason that the same URL, except for an S in after the HTTP, has to be the same thing. There is a way in the accept header to use semicolon Q to rank the preference of what you would like to get back in terms of content type. And there's the content dispossession header, which is a way of saying, for instance, hey, don't show this to the user in their web browser. Instead, ask if they want to save it as an attachment. 
There's just so much more. And when I started investigating this, partly due to you know spam and accidents and whatnot, I got, sure, that feeling of power, of increased capability, that when you know more about what your tools can do, you'll get. But I also felt, honestly, filled often with a sense of wonder, a sense that I was in contact now with a new way of seeing things. When you start reading these RFCs, when you start really diving under the hood, it isn't just, oh, here's a bunch of code. There's an entire way of viewing the architecture that, I don't know about you, I have often taken for granted every day, both as a user and as a developer. When I subclassed from a particular base server that was in the Python standard library, I looked at the code. I read the code because you can do that because open source is great. And I saw right at the top of the file that in the comments it said that this code is in accordance with this specification written by people like Roy Fielding, one of the people who helped architect HTTP. We're standing on the shoulders of giants. We have so much to learn still from the ways of seeing that are afforded us by HTTP, honestly, thinking about representations, thinking about what we can do with them. And it makes you think, what might the web have been and what might it still be? We're still young. So you can read and play. You can read these RFCs, number 7230 through 7235. They got ASCII art. Can't be that hard. <laughs> There's Netcat, WGET, Netstat, Telnet. These are free tools available on Linux and probably on your favorite, in your favorite development environment as well that you can use to just play around with requests and networks. Look at basic HTTP servers in your favorite language. Just do the same thing I did, read that code. Go ahead and look at my code in Python 2 and Python 3. I'd like to thank Leonard Richardson, Greg Hendershot, Zach Weinberg, the Recur Center, and Clay Halleck for their conversations uh, that helped me develop this talk. I'd also like to thank Julia Evans, Allison Kaptur, Amy Hanlon, and Katie Silverio for the example they provided me in giving talks about things you should never do that are a lot of fun and end up teaching us a lot. So thank you very much. <laughs>